This is the Final Word Cricket Podcast, Season 15, Episode 28. It's the day after the Christchurch Test Match. Mm -hmm. We're all about to go our separate ways. Mm -hmm. We've just recorded story time where I said something very similar to that. I'm Adam Collins. Jeff Lemon and I have moved up to our kitchen table in the Airbnb that's been our own for the last seven days. Yep. An Airbnb that's been kind to us. It's been mm -hmm. over the back fence from Hagley Oval where the internet's never worked but we've made the best of it anyway. And we have quite a bit to get through in yep. a relatively short space of time before I fly to Melbourne for a few days and you jump on the road with Barat and Isha and mm -hmm. go and explore the South Island of New Zealand. But yeah, we had a lot of stuff to clear off the table, a lot of cords and cables and whatnot, a lot of uh, deluxe mixed cranberry <laughs> packets, uh, this Kennard's Hire um, tape measure that, that the nice Kennard's Hire man gave yeah. me. When I was trying to work out which table would fit where and where the air conditioner could go, and right. in the uh, in the com box, I asked to borrow a, a tape measure, and they said, "You can have this one. This is for you." And I was like, "I don't think I need to own a tape measure. I'm travelling New Zealand. I don't think it's going to come in handy after this." So I gave it back to them. And they said, "No, no, that's yours now." So I, I now own a Kenner Tire tape measure. Do you know they what don't I've... sponsor this show, but if they did, they'll give you a tape measure. <laughs> I was going to say, you know what I've learned over the years? Yeah. Kennards make your job easy. You know why I know yeah. that? Because they're pervasive Slogan. radio advertising, mm. right? And why not use that as a segue to say goodbye to C-Bus? Yeah. Not, not, not forever goodbye. This is a, a see you later, C-Bus. Well, in the same way as I'm saying goodbye to you. Exactly. We will, we will see C-Bus, all things being equal, mm. later in the year. Um, but um, they... Uh, uh, they uh, had signed on for the Aussie summer, and that, by definition, well, we're even we're deep into the autumn summer. now. Yeah. Uh, we're deep into autumn. Hey, and it's still summer. It's still kind of technical. It's still up until like the twenty first or whatever, when the actual equinox bit season change thing right. happens. But you know, our season things are arbitrary. We're just like, yeah, that's a month. Yeah, that's a month. Yeah, we'll just chop, <laughs> put an extra day on that one every four years. But it does feel like the summer's finished. Yeah. I mean, it does it feel does like we're in Christchurch and it's freezing. And that too, but more like you know when the Test cricket, when you know when you get to the end of that tour, yeah. whatever the tour is this time yeah. of year, it does feel like oh, that's the end of the cricket that's season. The end of it. And it's not entirely, of course, the Sheffield Shield, which we'll come to later. At the very end of the show, it's Stumps Day One in the Shield, so mm. it's hard for us to talk about that comprehensively. But we will touch on it later. Um, we've got. Uh, the series that's finished in India between England and India that you and I haven't really had a chance to have a swing at yet. Mm -hmm. We've got some quite fun stuff happening in Asia, which has been going under the radar because there's been test series going on, but um, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, which is always worth keeping an eye on. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Ireland, some some not so good stuff with Ireland as well. Some ICC stuff going on. It's going to be a show that's more tilted that way. And of course, the county championship is nearly back and there's been some fun stuff also happening in Zimbabwe. Well, fun for some, less fun for others. Mm. But yeah, as we launch into all of this, Jeff, um, Seabus Super, they're a, they're a fine supporter of ours. They've been with us since 2018. Since the rights heist of 2018, mm. they've been um, solid partners to us. And we just wanted to thank them sincerely for making what we've done over the last four months much easier. Um, we don't do anything else really now apart from the podcast and commentary because we don't have time. And that's a great problem to have. It is a great thing that we make so many podcasts per year and we're a, a privileged to be in this position to do that. But to make it work and make it line up and, you know, we've all got things to pay for and bills mm -hmm. and mortgages and mm -hmm. whatever and travel and so on. Um, it requires having um, the support of our patrons and commercial partners. And yes, yeah, CBUS, it, you know, it feels like more than a commercial partnership, what we've got going with them. Like we do feel like we're part of their world. And we know that um, a lot of people who listen to the show feel that way as well, riding the CBUS. In, in French, they would be CBUS super. <laughs> and and that, that, is, that is what they've been. It's nice, to, it's nice to help with spreading the word about things that are actually good yes. and that actually help people instead of like, hey, why don't you come and lose all your money on this specious bullshit? Um, <laughs> hey, like every time you open the social media apps now and it's just, it's just it's all just crypto NFTs bullshit. Like it, it's we've got another scams. we've got another email today asking to, for some crypto bullshit to sponsor us. You know that that and that's the thing that we don't ever do. Everyone's We've never, never, never done gambling money, which everybody else does. Let's be honest, every other podcast touches gambling money. Well, not everyone, but most do at some point or another or crypto or all this other nonsense. We, we, yeah, we, mm. As you say, it's better to... We feel better about the world and better about what we're doing, about yep. working with an organisation like an industry super fund. Looking after people in their retirement, which is a nice thing to be able to do. So, yes, thank you. Thank you for doing that. And thanks to uh, everyone listening for listening to us talk about it for the last few months. And for the last time there, 8.89% average returns over the 40 years and their default count, brilliant as it is. 
that isn't a reliable indicator of future performance. Well, get in touch yeah. with us or with them and get your super sorted out in their 40th anniversary year, 2024. Uh, Jeff mentioned you're hitting the road. Just give us a flavour of what you're, what you're going to be doing. I mean, I haven't really spoken to you about this off air, but um, have, you, have you got any real plans? Well, or are you just hitting the road like Brat well, style? Well, well, yeah, let's, okay, uh, I'll, 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 I'll triangulate this. Um, uh, it's me and it's Barrett. Mm. And and it's Isha who is a more organised person, but who is also married to Barrett. So so she knows what she's signing up to. Basically, I think she's just um, reached the point over that relationship of just just let you just let things go most of the time. So <laughs> that is a short way of saying we have no idea. I don't know where we're going today. I don't know where we're staying tonight. Um, I, I have a loose idea of a few places it would be good to get to in the next five or six days. Uh, we'll be trying to do an interview down in the southern part of uh, ah, yes. New Zealand. In Otago. Yes, so I'm mm. sure we won't go into more detail on until it's actually in the can. <laughs> I, I don't like to talk about these things before they've happened. But, um, yeah, we're going to figure it out probably in the back of the car on okay. the way down the highway today. Terrific, terrific. Well, enjoy that. Five or six days. Last time, 2016, when we were here, we had to leave straight away after the test and didn't get a chance to explore the South Island after you and I had driven around a lot of the North Island mm. together. So um, this this time I'll have a look at the South. I've done the South Island in a car a long time ago now, 2009. But yeah, I remember it being a thoroughly sort of fulfilling experience. Mm. I'm sure it'll be for all of you over the next week or two, however long you're away for. As I say, I'm back to Melbourne. Back to I've not been in Melbourne for a Hawthorne game since 2016 when we lost to the Dogs in the semi-final. So the fact that I'll be there around one at the G is pretty special, um, given what a big part of my life that has been. But mm -hmm. unusual to be in the Southern Hemisphere when it's you know nearing towards cricket sure. season in the Northern Hemisphere and the family and so on. So taking that opportunity. Also going to be DJing Andy McClellan's finishing school on Friday night at um, at Trades Hall. Jeff, you're a, you're a regular there at trades at finishing school so I haven't mm -hmm. done that since I've not done that since that night actually come to think of it the 2016 dogs final I went straight from the game that we lost straight to trades and did it then and a number mm. of other times when I was living in Melbourne but um yeah that's that's a great night so the tickets are on sale I'm not saying you have to come but if it's your thing it's sort of you know what would you indie pop dancey fun yep. good, uh, good, good I'm good self conscious energy. dance floor yeah you don't you have to worry about anyone judging you for being a loser when you're having a good time I'll be dancing on the stage mm. I'll be taking up the you opportunity to, to you're not give to absolutely everything up there. You're not allowed to play there unless you dance to your own tunes. Yeah, yeah that's You've got right. to believe in your own product. No, no, absolutely. So that'll be Friday Unlike night. Unlike Pablo Escobar. <laughs> he never did cocaine. Didn't do it. Then I'll jump on a plane to London and then we will yeah, start gearing up for... I'm um, gearing up uh, gearing for up. the uh, the New England season. So yeah, as we leave New Zealand, we we've obviously recorded a uh, wash up podcast yet. Well, sorry, a day four podcast yesterday. Mm. We tend to do a wash up the day after instead of a dedicated episode. We're just going to talk about this will it. be it. This will be it as part of it. Um, it I just can't get away from feeling this sense of uh, this sense of like loss that we're leaving New Zealand. Mm. Loss is the wrong word. I, I just wish we were coming back in four years time when I kind of know yeah. we won't be. Like, let's be honest, we know the FTP has New Zealand coming out for four test matches in 26-27, and that's great, like the fact that they've been able to get an extra test in there. Yep. I know it's at the expense of Bangladesh playing in the heart of the summer, but you know, all everything's broadly worked out okay in a very, very busy year, 26 into 27. But you know, the FTP as it is, it takes us out to 28. The FTP won't let me be. <laughs> and if... <laughs> Uh, and, and if and if they're not playing up until then, I mean, you know, is it going to be eight years again? Yeah. Uh, is it going to well, be six, seven it's, years? It's, you know, it's, should it's, be every four. It's twenty twenty eight at the earliest. You know, if if they get right out of the blocks um, with with the new FTP, once that comes out, and that is four years away already. Um, it, it could should be every four. I mean, it, honestly, it could be every two. Like, it doesn't take that long to duck over here and play a couple of test matches. Yeah, they could do it that way. I think they should. I think we talked about this on the weekly show last week, but just to sharpen up this point as we leave the country, the, the board, now we've got the Chapel Hadley being a T20 if you want it to be a T20. Honestly, the Chapel Hadley is anything. It, it, they squeeze it into whatever shape it was. Remember, the the most embarrassing bit was when they contested it for the group game in the 2015 World Cup. That's right. That? That's right. I do you remember but that? Literally, the one-off group match that they played at Eden Park, the, that great game that New Zealand won, they had, they passed over the Chapel Hadley Trophy on the basis of a group game in, a, in an existing tournament, one, so, one match. Yeah, so there's, there's an easy bit here. At the end of the... I say easy, all, all scheduling is hard, but comparatively easy. The Australian T20 side needn't be the first 11, right? Mm. It's long since been that. It, it, it moulds to what it needs to be at different points in players' mm -hmm. recovery cycle and the forward agenda and whatever. At the end of the Big Bash, 
And at the end of the Super Smash, around that same time of year, and I'm not saying it should be a BBL All-Stars necessarily, but guys who have shown a bit in that, combined with guys who, yep. uh, who are more senior, who aren't necessarily playing in the big match but are available, three games in four days, or it could be three games in three days, but you know, you can space it out on a Friday, a Sunday, and a Monday, whatever you yeah. want it to be, um, and that, that should be every year, and it should be over here. That's, that's a little give to New Zealand cricket from, you know, CA have talked yep. a big game about giving more to New Zealand. Those, for whatever reason, bilateral white ball cricket rates its socks off over here in a mm. way that it doesn't in Australia. They get packed houses here for it in a way that it doesn't in Australia. Mm. If you play to Chapel Hadley every year in New Zealand, yep. it, it's, a, it's an easy thing that where CA can exercise a bit of redistributive power yep. by scheduling, a clever yep. way of doing it. So it's, I, it's, it's shorter than some shield flights. It's, it could be yeah. done in a week, um, total lead up and, and lead out one and done. So, so there's that. So that should be every year. And on the other side of it, the Trans-Tasman Trophy should be played for on exactly the same frequency as the Border Gavaska and the Ashes, which is yeah. every two, fourth year, in, you know, every two years, years. Twice in four years, once home away. But we're on the same, the same season, so it could just be every second season. Sure, but I think in reality, due to the other commitments and so on, I'm just making the point that th I mean, th like there's no reason. once once away. Yeah. Across, it, across the four. So, so you don't have the 18 month, two and a half year bit that you have with the Ashes. Oh, sorry, right. Because yeah, it, yeah. it could be at the end of a summer. Every second year, you're contesting yeah. it in one country or the other. Yeah, and hopefully over three test matches as that, yeah. you know, as that continues to grow in momentum. So, but yeah, the um, we were meant to have the, the chief executive of New Zealand cricket on this week, but that fell through at the last minute, which was disappointing, um, I have to say. But that he's off to Dubai for the ICC meetings this week. We'll talk a little bit more about that mm. later on. It'll be interesting to see how he goes in, in that forum and how. New Zealand express themselves in that forum under new leadership. By all reports, he's doing a good job, but um, that's different gravy, right? Going up and duking it out. Well, maybe not duking yeah. it out, but all the subcommittees before they go. And like that's a whole different level um, of, of diplomacy and, and, and power and how it's exercised and, and so on. And New Zealand have got a fair bit of authority at ICC level at the moment because they've got the the chair of the organisation as Greg Barclay over the last couple of years. But yes, yeah, sir. A new chief executive coming in, I think um, Weenick started in about August or yep. September last year. So he's had some experience in the job, but this will be one of the first times he's had to duke it out over there. As for everybody else, they're, they're going to the IPL, really. Mm -hmm. um, a few Australian players are sticking around doing what you're doing. You're going to run into a couple of them, I suspect, in Queenstown. Yeah. Um, but um, the rest of them, Mitch Marsh said to me... He gets... If I've got Barrett with me, there's no way we're not running into Alex Carey yes. in Queenstown. Yes, that's true. Um Mitch Marsh said to me, he's getting four nights at home in Perth. Mm. Well, it might be five now because of the really test finishing early, but still, four or five nights in his own bed. Then off to the IPL, and they actually don't come home from the IPL. It's IPL, would you believe, that goes all the way up until the T20 World Cup I starts. Would so yeah. we're, we're talking, it's the 12th of March today. Mm. The T20 World Cup starts in the first week of June. So we're talking, because of the pre-tournament commitments in India, that will run them all the way through now. April, May, and into June before Christ. they um, are representing Australia again. So it's a reminder of the type of schedule these guys yeah. are keeping. Yeah, coming off that 2023 when they were just on the road for the entire mm. year as well. Um, and, you know, they didn't get much of a break. They got, what, three, it was three weeks between coming back from the World Cup and the first test. Some of them played white ball stuff in that gap. Yeah. I mean, so, it's, so it's a it's quiet a lot, year for yeah. some of them. Nathan Lyons playing all formats for Lanks and yeah. playing a whole season over there, and we speculated the Which other day. Which be a bit more low key, like at least you'd be travelling within the, the one country and that kind of thing. Probably yeah. quite a lot of fun, you know, yeah. playing in front of a few thousand people and getting to just do what he loves doing most, which is bowling off spin. Um, yeah. He'll probably have a ball doing it. Never done a full season line. He played a little bit for Worcester back mm -hmm. in 20, let's call it 2016, but a full campaign in county cricket will be something else. Likewise, Scott Boland, and there'll yep. be others who'll end up signing contracts. Kerry sure. said he basically doesn't have anything on um, through the middle of the year, and he, yep. he might he might see if he can get signed up for a, a, a T20 league somewhere yep. for a month or whatever it is. But, you know, we'll basically be at home. Chance for them to earn some money. For, well, not that they don't earn heaps of money, but if they want to cash in, they mm -hmm. couldn't really do it in 2023 because of the the compact schedule, and uh, and they most of them declined the offer to play in the IPL. That, mm. Of course, it's the other way now where mentioned Marsh, but Stark and Cummins and you know, everyone will do it. The top flight guys all go now, yeah, don't they? Yeah, they'll look to hone T20 stuff and in, take it into that T20 World Cup mm. and then I guess have a break after that. There'll be some white ball tours, but I'm, I'm not sure that the you know the top line all format players, I kind of doubt, will be involved with much of that. Probably not a bad tour to go on, right? Eight games in England in September. Mm. It's not a bad, you know. Yeah. 
Um, it'll be after the World Cup, I suppose. It'll be by then they're thinking about the Champions Trophy, which is in the March of 2025. Mm-hmm. This, as we say all the time, is not a great sport for finish lines. It just moves on and on and on. So it will for England and India. England on their way yes. home at the moment. India um, celebrating a 4-1 series victory from being 1-0 down. We didn't get a chance to um, get into the Jimmy Anderson 700 stuff, which I think is worth just noting given we've... Followed his career so closely. He's been playing cricket for England for our entire adult lives. I mean, he made his debut in 2003 yeah. when I was an 18-year-old pup and you would have been a couple of years on from that or whatever, but still, he's it, been a constant. He was. It, it really struck home this week given that we were talking about Mitchell Stark having taken 350 test wickets mm. and Anderson's literally doubled it. Yeah. Um, having played for so much longer and, and having had even more opportunity. I mean, England play even more tests than Australia do. Um, and, and Anderson's missed some chunks through injury, but not long. I suppose there's, 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 there are a couple of longish bits and there are those first few years where he doesn't get picked a lot either. Mm. So, I mean, he could have played probably 220 by now if, he, if he'd played all of the tests available in that time. They've worked out Cam and Vish, I think, the other day or someone did. It was on the wrap-up podcast that if he were to play every test from now until 2025, middle of the year, the 200th would be the Zimbabwe match. 22 years on from when he made his debut against Zimbabwe at the same ground. It's improbable, of course, <laughs> that that would play out in such a way. But, you know, yeah. with Anderson, it's the sort of thing where maybe he'll commit to that. And yeah. Cullum and Stokes will clearly want Anderson playing every home match this summer yeah. if he's fit. Well, if they play, I, I was thinking about the 800 and I was like, well, if he had a real, if he had a bumper year, they say they play 15 tests and he takes four wickets of tests and that's 60 of them. I'm like, we could do it if he played another two years. How many maybe. tests has he played now? 180. 188, 187. 187, right. So if you use that as the benchmark, the 13, the 200, hmm. yeah, it, it, would, it would take a fair bit. But he, he could hit the 200 on about 760 wickets. Right, right. And then, well... If he got, he's, he's had runs in his career. I mean, it's, again, it's unlikely at this age he'll have the best run ever of his career. But, but you no, know, six tests against the Windies and Sri Lanka in home conditions. You can see a world where he hmm. does clean up. Yeah. He has cleaned up against the Windies at home before, mm-hmm. Sri Lanka likewise, mm-hmm. a while ago, albeit for them. Sri Lanka haven't played a Test Series in England since 2016. Can't rule it out, can't rule it out. Um, and Ashwin's 100th Test, which we you know, somehow didn't talk about really at all um, coming coming into that final one. It's funny, there was a lot of chat about Bairstow playing 100, less about Ashwin playing 100. Um, in some ways, he should be the guy to take 800 wickets, but yep. India just don't pick him enough of the time. Like he's, he's still been seen as expendable. Imagine it. Like he'd have 600 wickets if they'd actually picked him more consistently. It's amazing to think how often he's been 12th man. Left out, yeah. yeah. Like for entire series at times, yeah. Australia and, entire tours. And, and, and in England and in other parts of the, the senior countries yeah. as, they, as they describe it in India. We don't use that term so much over here, but South Africa, England, mm. New Zealand, Australia, where he's seen as surplus to requirements when mm. they've got Jadeja there to bet at six. Um, it was awesome to see Kuldeep Yadav like getting I mean, another spinner who's left out all the time, but he, he's, he's improved himself so much. We saw him have that terrific World Cup. Um, the influence that he had through the test just gone, the way that he was able to, I mean, left arm wrist pin, something people don't see a lot of. Um, Cam's take on it was, was very amusing. Yeah. But it, it can be super effective because it's so rare like how many how many players are, are playing good left arm wrist spinners regularly let alone ones who are bowling it quick and turning it and have variations mm. yeah, I think Jared crunched the numbers that Cool Deep's like got the third most test wickets ever bowling left arm wrist spin or something and he's only played now yeah. 11 tests it's amazing that he'd only played 7 until this series and he never played more than 2 in a row so he'd yeah, been yeah. given 4 on the trot here it's after the Jadeja, he'd play the one in Sydney <clears throat> or whatever. Yeah, that's yeah. it. He'd play one here, one there, and they were using three spinners. He might get a go, but because mm. they had Akshar Patel, who for a time there was such a staple of the lower middle order. Like when Australia were there last year, there was really no talk of Kuldeep because no. they had Ashwin, Jadeja, Akshar. Akshar. Akshar was so effective with the bat that he provided that flexibility to them, and they were bowling Australia out with with two of them anyway when the when the tracks were turning. So, um, but yeah, love it. Cool deep, you know, we saw his debut, didn't we, um, in, yeah. in Durham Sharla all those years ago, and um, we've always felt sort of invested in him doing well. But, um, yeah, uh, play on for him, and hopefully he gets more opportunities outside of India as well. Johnny Bairstow, on the other hand, you know, you talk about Ashwin and Anderson still mm. having headroom. Um, I, I do wonder whether Bairstow's played his last test match. I, you know, I think if McCullum... So McCullum's now saying that, uh, that they are thinking about how they'll remodel the 
test side for the summer ahead. And that makes sense. You know, they've had two full years with the same group. They've got a summer now right. where they should, and remembering they can't make the World Test Championship final, they're so far behind having lost 19 points. So that works out to they lost a test and a half and more worth of points due to slow mm. over rates against Australia, and fair enough. They've lost four test matches in India. How they lost two against that? Australia. So, you know, the probability of them, they, they can't. They can't make the finals. So yep. what they can do is use the, the test between now and then to play the long game a little bit if they wish to, to start thinking about when India will be out the following summer for them and right. when they go to Australia in uh, it'll be 25, 26, won't it, when the next time England are in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. They go to New Zealand, so they can use the, the home test against the Windies in Sri Lanka and the away series against New Zealand to really start ramping up for what always ends up being their biggest bilateral engagements. Not to diminish the other nations on the way, but it's just the reality. They think in those terms. Mm -hmm. um, so there might be some change. And if there's going to be change, well, Harry Brooks obviously straight back in the side, no mm -hmm. doubt in the world, because mm -hmm. he's a long-term and he's already delivering when yeah. he's playing. So, okay, there's that Bairstow potential replacement. Does Bairstow get the gloves back at home or do they go to someone who they wish to invest in for the long term? Yeah. James Ruse, well, the obvious one. The, the other, Ollie Robinson, had yeah. a sensational year last year when moving clubs. They have got options. You just must wear a T-shirt that says, not that I'm one. not that guy. Every, I'm, everywhere I'm, I'm he goes. I'm not that dude. But they've got, they've got I think it's great time for flexibility. A name change up. You know, there was the kind of Jimmy Anderson saying, just call me James Anderson. <laughs> Make himself Oliver. Just be Oliver Robinson. Has, has, Jimmy, has Jimmy said that calling me no, James? No, it was years, years ago. It was oh, years right. ago. And, and it probably wasn't. Him. Probably someone asked him, what do you want on the sheet? And he said, oh, I'll put James. Like the, the Ricky thing, right? When yeah. Ricky Ponting, when there was a story that Rick. came back from the 2003 World Cup saying, Ricky Ponting now wishes to be called Rick Ponting. Rick Ponting. And he very quickly cleared it up and said, I've said nothing, nothing of the sort to anyone no, ever. No, no. <laughs> so it, was, it was probably a stitch up by somebody. But it was, there was like a season or two where they were like, um, you know, please, please refer to him as James Anderson. All oh, right. So you could put that. You could you could just start asking to be Oliver on the score sheets and just make sure that you were just just make it a bit different. Maybe throw a middle name in there. Maybe change your name completely. Maybe it's time. You know, if there is if there is an absolute egregious fuckwit with your name, just in theory. I'm not talking about this specific case, of course. But of course not. In theory, in theory, if, if that were to be the case. Um, maybe just give it a change. Yep. You know, maybe just say uh, maybe you could be. John Bracewell. I don't know. <laughs> like, whatever. Just pick something else. <laughs> you can be an angry man like John... Well, angry, very effective man like John Bracewell yeah. as well. Um, Peter such. Uh, well, just maybe pick someone who's not an existing cricketer because I can't think of any names. That right are, now, your but, brains, yeah. yeah. You can be called Dermot Burr. <laughs> Dominic <laughs> Cork. Uh, yeah, you could, be, you could be Robert Stevenson. You know, uh, just, just just go with something bland. Ollie, right? change your name. Ollie, change your Ollie, name. Ollie, change your name because it's yeah. always going to be with you. He might play test cricket next year. And yeah, this is kind of the point, right? They've got the chance here to take guys who are in their first third of their careers who have already shown that they're um, good enough to uh, dominate at county level. And James yeah. Rue, it's just one season. I don't want to get too far ahead on him, but, you know, Robinson's slightly, yeah. slightly more advanced. And and a wicketkeeper is the kind of position where you can set and forget for a decade if you get mm. it right. Mm. You know, drummer in the band and all yeah. that. Name is, um, yeah, but um, folks kept history. really well in India. Didn't bat that well, but nobody else did. Like, maybe you just stay with that. You I could stay know, with folks, absolutely. Uh, my my point stuff. probably is more that what are you getting back? Yeah. What What's the upside of putting Bear State back behind the stumps in the home summer when yeah. they're talking already about this rejuvenation process. Sure. So we discussed last week about the Spinner situation. He's elaborated on that. McCullum saying that, you know, maybe Leach will experience some competitive pressure from Hartley especially, who in English conditions and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's a bit going on there. It does feel like a bit of growth that McCullum's acknowledging that some of the uh, stuff that was said in the dressing room that got repeated by the players in public mm. um, needs to um, now be yeah. kept in check. Like the PR um, of the McCullum-Stokes regime, <coughs> as good as it was in yeah. year one, not quite so good in year two. Yeah. Effect, but effectively, yeah, McCullum was like, please please stop saying silly shit. <laughs> it gets us in trouble. I'll yeah. say it, but you don't repeat it. I will it. say it to you. <laughs> to fire you up. You don't then say it outside. Yeah. Um, as, as my friend CB likes to say, you know what that is? That's growth. Mm. And maybe it is growth, but it still has to trickle through to the players who, who, are, who just don't always seem to be absolutely as sharp as they might be mm. on figuring out the way that some of these things might come across. Some other bits and pieces uh, before we move off this and, and go to Nerd Pledge and, and all the rest of it. World Test Championship, India are up to 68.5% now. So they've put a gap in it, so to speak. New Zealand are down in third now. They were first a fortnight ago. They're on 50%. New Zealand now play five test matches in Asia. 
Australia um, have their next engagement, um, mm-hmm. not until they play India at home. So that'll that'll play out in the usual way, I suppose. But India have got one foot in that final already on the basis of what they've achieved against England, which is the way these things work. If they have a good series against New Zealand, they'll just about lock it up and they'll be playing in their third consecutive final, of course, having lost the first two. So they'll add Coley and you know, KL Rahul to that side mm-hmm. as well. I'm not sure who misses out because the replacements, if you like, have been terrific. I mean, Safras Khan... Talking about players who might have a long yeah. career, you know, yeah. why would you be parting with him? It, it, Loves the fifty. It'll be great competitive tension yeah. for, for India when they get to their next selection table. Love, meeting loves, selection a, meeting. loves a fifty, and imagine what might happen if he starts making hundreds. Safras Khan, yeah, he was he was he was my favourite bit of that series. Was watching him lay into them um, at different times. He's 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 different. He's he's had to wait for so long, um, and he's just been relentless while he's been waiting so that was enjoyable all right jeff wrap up chats complete for the two series we've done dailies on yep. all of them it's been hard yakka thank you everybody for watching them on on youtube or and all of our co-hosts as well so cam oh, yeah. and to daniel norcross and the Badushna hunteraja to will mcpherson to mm-hmm. Sundaresan, and, and you go back into the australian summer as well adam white mm-hmm. um you know we, we've done a lot of these over the last four months yep. um we've again we mentioned cbus before where cbus and westfield have been part of that um, support act for us and um, on we go our daily shows now cease until the T20 World Cup yeah a couple of couple of daily free months we've got some other plans some things in the works so uh, keep an ear on the feed there we might be bumping up story time a little bit uh, speaking of let's let's do Zimbabwe after the break because we've got to get to story time please now we, it's not story time no pledge no pledge no pledge <laughs> no pledge <laughs> The game that I forgot the name of that we play with nice people on the internet who fund the show by sending in contributions that are an amount of currency that relates to a cricket thing. And we don't know what it is, except in this case where I did know what it was because <laughs> Nick Ibis is very helpful and a yeah. long-time friend of the show. Sure is. G'day, Nick. Uh, from Adelaide, $7.44 was the number. And he said, look, you're, you're not going to figure this out. So um, he sent me a link to it, something he'd put on Twitter. Very, very good Twitter account, Nick Ibis. Underrated. Does good do- does good work on there. I'm not. I mean, I think everyone should be off the platform because it's just a, a rat fest, uh, burning building for Nazis. But apart from that, I hope, <laughs> uh, if, take it to another platform, Nick. Move to move to Blue Sky or something and continue your good work over there. Um, the number was seven dollars forty four, and so he directed me to a post where he he was looking at Darcy Brown's career, um, which involved at that time, if you included the WBBL games, 74 matches played across formats and four innings batted. Okay. And he was wondering, he was pondering to himself whether this was a record, whether whether ah, anyone right. had played so many games and batted so few times. Never in the field of human history has so mm. little been batted by so few. Right, okay. okay. Does well, that make I, sense? I, I, it does make sense. I feel like I should say at this juncture that yeah. Seb Goldsmith, another one of our South Australian patrons who... Yeah enjoy the work of very much and as we mentioned recently um he's become a dad for the first time in the last few months as well wicked keeper wicked dismissal keeper. creator um seb uh, relayed to us yesterday that amanda jade wellington had nearly had a bannerman on the weekend oh. playing club cricket 109 out of like 150 or something ridiculous so wow. she you know she who is so brilliant <coughs> with her leg spin right. um, can also do other things including batting as she has quite well over the last few years at Port Adelaide, isn't it? I think mm. she plays a club cricket. Anyway, please go on. They've got the power to rule. Um, right. Two things here. One is that this number of 74 matches included the Big Bash. Um, I don't have a stats engine that can do Big Bash stuff. We used to, Crick Info used to do all the women's T20s. They used to give you access to the innings by innings information on that. And now they've backtracked and just made it T20 internationals. Um, and, and the if they other, let us pay for it, by the way. And no, I know the first class database is incomplete yeah. with Crick Info, and that's why it's not public. You have to work there to get it. If they said to me, you know, Adam, are you willing to part with a, a lot of dollars per year yeah. for it? I would say, I will pay you a lot of yes. dollars for it. Name the sum. Almost name the sum. Yeah. We do so much story time mm-hmm. stuff that would be made that much easier if, if Crick Info simply let us tap into their domestic database. If you're listening, Crick Info... Give us the keys. Give us the keys. We'll, we've both worked there. We've, yeah. We, we have we've freelanced to you. But we've written for you. We've, we've, re- done, we've done heaps of stuff. Heaps of WBBL stuff yeah. and... Videos. And I was looking up something about the 2017 Women's Ashes only a few days ago. And there we the were. And there was your face talking to Heather Knight. I'm like, I've We've done so here. much stuff for Crick Info. Yeah. Get us in the back end. Yeah. Well, there we go. Um, right. Now, 
<laughs> we are looking at Darcy Brown's career. So I can only do this in terms of international games, Nick, at the moment. Um, the other thing is that this was a while ago. At that point, Darcy had only played 31 international matches. Now she has played 63 international matches. So the overall numbers now are 63 matches played, five innings batted in international cricket, mm -hmm. um, which is a function of the Australian women's team being very good, which means that the number 11 is not often called upon to bat. Um, generally speaking, is this a record? Well, probably, almost certainly, yes. Uh, in men's cricket, uh, looking for someone with five batting innings or fewer across all international games, um, Viraj Patel, a left-arm spinner for Kenya, played 38 games and only batted five times. Um, but that is far fewer than, than Darcy across her international career. Um, Darcy Brown holds a couple of records. She's batted, where are we? Three times in test cricket in four tests. So you're more, much, more, much more likely to bat yeah. in a test match because, you know, you, you just keep going down through the order. Like when you see Glenn McGrath's one-day stats and it mm. would say, like, he's played 150 games yeah. for 200 runs or something yeah, like yeah, that. Exactly. Not even that. Um, she's batted twice in T20 internationals in 30 starts. And she has never batted in a women's one-day international. <laughs> right. Never. She's never been called upon in a 50-over game, which I think is a pretty awesome number to have. So that... Is definitely a record. Darcy's played 19 ODIs and never batted. Nobody has played as many as 19 without having batted. Um, there are there are a few who've played 20 or 30 odd, having only batted three or four or five times. Um, but basically, because so I, I suppose by the time she gets up to their number, she could have batted once more and then not have that record. But at the moment, she's got the record in terms of the number of matches she's played. She's played 30 T20s and batted twice. That's also a record. Nobody has uh, played as many as 30 games and only batted twice. There are a handful with four or five innings who've played a few more games than her, but not many, so she might hold that record. Um, and then in Test, Test is the only one where she's not sort of the out-and-out out leader, so four Tests, three innings. Um, there are a few ahead of her who've played five tests or even six tests and only batted once, twice or three times. Uh, Catherine Mowat, Sally Moffat, Charmaine Mason, Olivia Magno, Katrina Keenan, who we talked about a fair bit mm. on a story time a few months ago um, in that, that 2000 World Cup final when New Zealand beat Australia. Oh yeah, back in 2000, that was yep. that, was that here? Was that in Christchurch, the World Cup final that year? I've forgotten, I think it might have been. Yeah. Um, Shona Gilchrist, the original Gilchrist, Avril Fay. Um, they're the ones who've got a, a less batting test record than Darcy Brown. But I think if you combine all of that together, cumulatively 63 games, five innings batted across formats, um, that's it. And so I wouldn't be surprised if, if her big bash numbers are still um, the, the pack leader as well. But that is not something that I can look up very easily without <laughs> essentially looking at every WBBL scorecard in history, um, which, you know, it would be possible. There have been, what, four? 40 something games a season 59 59 games 59, a season yeah. for about 10 years so, so it's only 500 games I could probably do it in a day um, but um, that's not something I'm going to do today for you Nick I've done what I can <laughs> thank you for the number that's Nerd Pledge if you want to send one in uh, patreon.com slash the final word I checked that McGrath stat by the way 251 day international 68 innings 38 not out where he probably faced one ball for 115 runs 115 runs so, yes, still Australia's right. leading wicket taker oh no format. sure 500 and sorry as is James Anderson for England which I find curious I don't think either of them will ever no. be overtaken I'll not play the enough way to do it things have um, evolved and so on in one day cricket beauty okay Jeff that's segment one done we'll be back shortly to talk about well Quite a lot. Most of it overseas. A lot of uh, bilateral cricket and a bit of chaos along the way too. This is The Final Word with Adam Collins and Jeff Lemon. We're up to episode 28 of season 15. If you're wondering why we're not in season 16 yet, that starts when the Australian domestic season finishes mm -hmm. and the UK season starts again. We have our convention. So yes. we'll end up recording about 34 four or 35 uh -huh. episodes in season 15, which won't be the most. We had a season where we got to close to 50, uh, but I don't really remember why that was. No, reasons. Yeah, lots of interviews, lots I of think. interviews. Because we weren't doing um, as many... Uh, as many daily shows so it might be that we um, do a lot in season 16 in fact I'd yep. anticipate that we will uh, let's start in Zimbabwe shall we we don't go there too often and the reason I'm doing that is because we're nearing that aforementioned county cricket season in 2024 mm. and Durham who've been promoted to division one mm. have been playing in the Zimbabwe 
T20 domestic tournament. Yes. Not without precedent. We've no. seen um, sides play in the winter elsewhere from England. I remember when there was an England A team that played in the four-day comp in the West Indies, which Ian Bell, um, we, when we interviewed him uh, last year, he was part of that squad. Um, the North side have played overseas before in different comps. They, this is not... The first time is my point, I suppose. But I'd, I'd never heard of it before. I must yeah. admit, I was perplexed uh, at trying to decode <laughs> why Durham County Cricket Club was playing the Mashona Land Eagles the in Lady the final Eagles. too, in the grand final of this deep, this T Twenty comp. You know, they were they were undefeated. They'd won all five group games and got through mm. to the, the final. Ryan Campbell's charges, former yeah. guest of the show, and they made two twenty nine for six. Unlike Geelong in ninety two and ninety four, Durham were able to knock off the Eagles in the grand final. <laughs> Baz Delita. Uh, made a quick 50, who we like the work of. The Eagles then uh, lost two wickets in the first over, including Craig Irvine. You, this will, if, For those who haven't caught up with this, it'll make sense why we're discussing this at the start of segment two in just a moment from now. Two wickets in the first over. Craig Irvine is the captain of Zim's men team at the moment, was part of that. They were five for five in the third over, and they were all out after 8.1 overs. Five Durham bowlers took twofers. The highest score for Marshall, and it was nine, they were all out for 16, and Durham have stuck it right up and won the grand final by 213 runs, the third highest margin in any men's T20, the highest non-international, because there's been some extraordinary blowouts where in because every T20 has international status right. now, which lends itself to slightly chaotic scorecards occasionally, which yep. we pick up on. But yeah, the... Um, Third lowest score ever in T20 cricket from Marshall. And they've all been quite recently. The Thunder mm. in the Big Bash last year making 15. The Isle of Man um, uh, making 10. In, they were missing know. Andrew McGlash. At, yeah, yeah, Nasha. Had Nasha been playing... No Nasha, no Isle of Man. You know what they say. They've all, they're always saying that. Yeah. They'll continue to say it. Um, and yeah, so record-breaking on, on a range of fronts and did provide... Um, you know, it did provide... Um, uh, some clicks, yeah. shall we say, to to uh, all the websites that do these types of things, where mm. um, Durham have um, have shattered in. Probably, probably more interest in in the Mashona Land Eagles than than most weeks. I'm, I reckon. Yes. I, I think it would yes. be fair to say curiosities are part of cricket. Um, I kind of that's 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 one thing. You know, I'm, if you listen to the show, you know we're not entirely sold on the T20 era. But one thing I do enjoy is the chaotic 1800s bullshit energy that it brings. It brings that back. <laughs> All of that mad shit that you used to see a couple yeah. of hundred years ago. That now happens. It just doesn't happen in sort of Test or First Class cricket so much. It happens in T20s. Yeah, yeah, especially you know with international status in those games that we referred to before. So the season proper begins on the 5th of April. That's the first round of four-day cricket. Uh, Durham have been, as I mentioned before, recently promoted mm. or promoted for this season, uh, hosting Hampshire, um, which will be a big game. Hampshire are very strong, although they, they haven't won the comp despite having been in the top three for the last half a dozen years. Uh, Worcestershire are the other team that went up uh, mm. and they're playing away at Warwickshire. So there's that rivalry between the Bears and the Pairs that will be able to... Um, go to a, another level now. They're both back in Division 1. Uh -huh. So we'll be back doing those recaps of the season and so on once we get to April. But, yeah, that, that felt noteworthy that Durham, who are on the way up and, you know, they baseball their way to a Division 2 um, a Division two trophy last year. Yeah. They, they battled at a very high run rate the whole way through the season. They've got excellent fast bowlers with Potts and Rain and Cast and so on. Um, they'll, I think they're going to be a handful in the top flight. And now they've got a, a T20 trophy from Zimbabwe to put in the cabinet as well. There we go. There'll be one in the WPL pretty soon. We're into yep. the second half of the group stage. Three games left and then the finals the last week or so. Delhi and Mumbai confirmed qualification spots. What a surprise. Mumbai, they're always doing stuff like that. Um, RCB and Uttar Pradesh uh, are both three and four with one game remaining. They're competing for third. That's yep. the last postseason spot, the McIntyre final three. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He'll be offended at the idea of a final three. Five teams into three. Give me a spell. Harman Kaur uh, getting back to some of her best uh, and, and um, it was an O'Neill Pendron, wasn't it, who was noting that, that Harman Preet's changed her back lift back to the way it used to be when she made all, all the runs in the, the World Cup semi-final. Um, she made 95 of 48 for Mumbai against Gujarat and chased down 192, which is a massive chase. And they were way off it too at the halfway yeah, yeah. mark. They were like 60 or something like that. So mm. she completely teed off. The, I mean, the other one, it, this is the time of, time of the season, I reckon, where your big overseas imports step up as well, right? This is where you earn your money. Mm. Nat Sivabrunt, who 
earns a lot of money from this competition. Oh, yeah. We interviewed her briefly last year and you know, she freely admits this is totally life-changing for her, playing a few seasons over in the WPL, made 45 and took two for 14 in, in the other win that they had during the week over the UP Warriors. And yeah, I thought that what would be best is we come back to this next week once we get to the business end with the, the finals. And I mm. think the grand final is week Saturday. And there's one more round of group games and that'll determine who makes the final three, right. along with Delhi and Mumbai. Right. Um, yes, so that's that's where they are um, at the moment, and there's women's domestic uh, yeah. machinations going on in England. Um, Kent and Northampton are among the two who've put in bids for the professional teams in this new three tier structure that, that the ECB is building, where where the the top tier will be um, will be pro teams linked to a county. Um, but then it was less clear about what would happen in the divisions below. Yeah, I'm, I'm enthused by this. I'm not sure if I've not spoken to anyone back in England about it. So, you know, there might be different views and I might be um, I might be misreading this. But it feels to me, having competitive tension from counties who are not, you know, sexy test playing grounds. I reckon yeah. when I saw that there was going to be three tiers, my automatic assumption was, okay, then, you know, there's going to be one at the Oval, which Surrey will look after. There'll be one at Lords, which the MCC and Middlesex look after. There'll be one at Edgbaston with yep. Warwickshire. There'll one be at one Manchester. at Manchester with Lancashire. There'll be one at Leeds with Yorkshire and so on and so on and so on. Yep. And the counties that actually usually have a lot to do with women's cricket and hosting the internationals will end up in Division 2 or Division mm. 3. Well, Kent, um, who have been aligned with Surrey as part of the, yep. the Stars. And hosted a lot of women's internationals at Canterbury. Absolutely. Like, I reckon, you know, if, you, if you're mapping out, well, certainly in the time that I've been covering England women's yeah. cricket. It's been Hove, Taunton, um, Hove, Taunton, Canterbury, but grounds and, like and, Leicester and, and Derby, and, you know, Worcester, yeah, like, it, it tends not to be the test playing grounds, yeah. right? But it's been their communities who have largely gotten behind it. And, and Bristol, I guess. And, and Kent won't be going, like, because they were with Surrey, who are definitely going to get one of these um, top flight, and fair enough too, Surrey have invested untold sums of money in women's sure. cricket. That's a great thing, right? But it does leave Kent as the junior partner in that part of England because those yeah. two counties border each other. So the fact they're, that they're doing the it... They're the Fitzroy of the Brisbane Lions merger. They, they, they were, they could be. But look look at who they've produced and what they've done. They've produced Tammy Beaumont, Alice Davison-Richards, Tash Farrant, Laura Marsh, Charlotte Edwards originally before she moved, Lydia Greenway. I mean, it's a, it's a proud club in women's cricket. They've won the comp... Uh, the 50 over comp 10 times, the 20 over comp five times, as recently as 2019, they won a trophy. All of that's been not at a test venue, air quotes, test venue. Yep. Um, so good on them for pitching up in the tender process. They may not get there, but I like the fact that a county like Kent is saying, we support women's cricket. We want to try and get there. Um, and we're going to kind of keep you honest in the process, mm. if nothing else. Similarly, Northamptonshire, who, again, you don't sort of think of North as, um my assumption was that your, your counties with less money and North Ants are one of those would be nowhere near this but they're like oh fuck it we're going to mm. chuck our hat in the ring as well so I don't know whether either of those counties will get the chance to be um, in the top tier but I think it's yep. a good thing that they that they want to be and uh, where we are in New Zealand there'll be a lot of white ferns action the New yeah. Zealand women's team will be playing England in a bunch of games Eight across of them. the next little while 5T20s uh, 3 ODIs Wellington getting involved the Tron Getting involved, Dunedin, Nelson, um, so a few different spots that they're hitting. You might be there. The I'm just thinking through it. You might be in Dunedin when, um, no, I'm maybe no, not quite. No. The first game's on the 19th of March. So you, you know, I think we're starting in that direction. Okay, so. I wasn't going to say you know do a quick daily show from a I'd have a busman's from um, a T20 from a, from a, from a T20 when, when you're meant to be having a high T20 in the middle of a five game series. True. Yeah, there's an A tour taking place alongside it, by the way, which is a good thing. So the, yeah. this is the. This is the professionalism. These are the opportunities that come from professionalism where you can send an A-team away to have a shadow tour concurrently. So we won't be covering those in daily shows. That won't be possible, but we will do um, We will do coverage. Well, we will have coverage of it in our weekly programs over the next few weeks. A uh, bit of colour and movement here, Jeff, which I put in the show notes thinking you would adore this storyline. It feels increasingly like Shane Watson's going to be the next men's coach of Pakistan. <laughs> So Watto's been coaching for the uh, uh, for the David Gleda Gladiators in the mm, PSL, mm. and when they're going well. Over. They're going well. They're going to make the finals, right? Yep. Um, in fact, I think they made the finals. Sorry for PSL super fans out there. I don't really follow it, but this is something I understand to be true. Yes. 
Um, but what I, bearing in mind, Muhammad Afiz was doing that job in a temporary capacity in yes. Australia over the summer. He was also the director of cricket at the same time well, so from what, memory. So he he had a never, dual he, role. He was never even formally the interim coach. He was the interim director of cricket. He was doing Mickey Arthur's job. Okay. And then they didn't send their actual coach um, and they just sent Hafiz instead. And then he ended up just effectively <laughs> being the coach, but not even in, formally in an interim role. He was the interim director of cricket doing a different job. And, uh, and acknowledging yeah, acknowledging the complexity here, which I think we did two weeks ago with, with how difficult it is for them to make decisions about their leadership structure when so much of it is mm. politicised, just had an election which is contested and, and, and so yeah. on, and, and there's a lot going on in Pakistan that we couldn't possibly do yeah. justice to. But the very fact that Shane Watson, everyone's reporting it, it's not like one yarn. Yeah. I, I did a quick search on this yesterday. There's like multiple journos are saying the same thing, that Watto is in the frame. It sounds yes. like Darren Sammy is also in the frame. He's oh. coaching the PSL as well. So okay. either way, there'll be a bit of generation change. But imagine what ends up on the tools. First big time coaching gig, yeah. being a national coach. I mean, it would make them, um, it, it would put it this way, their press conferences would be must see TV. <laughs> um, love Watto, very emotional kind of character. Um, he would be, he would be, um, it would be brilliant when they next play against Pakistan if we're there and, and so on. So let's hope that gets over the line. Yeah, every time, when I read the name, I always just hear, Watson, I hear it. It's like Alex Trebek doing. You won't remember this, but there was a there was like a Jeopardy challenge where IBM developed a an AI named Watson, and it went up against like the two all time Jeopardy champions to see whether a computer could beat right. human contestants. Um, and so there's, there's there's an amazing um, sort of podcast, not, not documentary, but a kind of a, an episode, a half hour episode made on it. Um, one, I'm throwing out a recommendation. There's a podcast called Imaginary Advice, which is my favourite show. And the episode's called Answer in the Form of a Question. Um, and he's got a lot of the audio from this. So there's just Alex Trebek going, Watson, 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 Watson. Correct. Well, Name I, it up, I, someone. I, and so it's all about how creepy computers, like why, why we kind of hate computers that vaguely mimic human behavior, essentially. And it's this line, which is, Watson, Watson is not connected to the internet. Watson is, for all intents and purposes, the internet. Um, yeah, anyway, it's a remarkable when are we, thing. On that, when are we getting Severance Season 2? Fuck me. Come on. When are we getting... Best show of two years ago. No season two yet. Come on. When are we getting Deadwood season four? Whatever it was. Never watched Deadwood. I know I should. Oh, Everyone nice. that likes the things I like says I'd like Deadwood. Yeah. I mean, I it's, it's horrible, but it's, yeah. it's very good. Horrible. So that's going on in Pakistan. If we jump over to Bangladesh um, at the moment, which isn't far What's away, it? just a Peter Hudson flat pun away. Um, now they, Bangladesh that is, hate Sri Lanka yeah. and Sri Lanka hate Bangladesh. Yeah. Yeah. And they're it's in the good. middle of a full tour. Mm. They're there for a long time. There's mm. T20s, then there's one days, then there's test matches as part of the World Test Championship cycle. Mm. Sri Lanka won the T20s 2-1 and Look, I don't care an awful lot about that series. It doesn't mean an awful lot to me. I don't expect it does an awful lot to you either. We'll, we'll pay more attention to bilateral T20 stuff around the World Cup. Um, so um, Sri Lanka won the first and the third, and uh, Bangladesh won the middle rubber. Yeah. But the real story here is um, is uh, Tawad Hudroy, who we um, tracked last year, copped a 15% fine uh, for breaching the spirit of cricket mm -hmm. when he absolutely cracked the shits and charged to the Sri Lankans when he got out in the third one day, which was quite good colour. Pretty lucky to only get away with 15% mm -hmm. uh, by the sounds of things, all finger waving and carrying on and so on. Now, this goes yeah, if back. If you with Seabus, would have been 8.89. Bang. This goes back to 2018 with the dancing and the snakes on social media and the hissing and the. Mm -hmm. I think we need to get. Andrew Fidel Fernando to join us yeah. on the show. He's written a piece about the history. Yep. Maybe we should get Isam, get Isam, Isam and, Fidel. and Fidel on the yeah. show at the same time head while this series is taking place. Maybe not even head to head. I suspect both of them will be quite open minded to both sides being at fault. Oh, they're colleagues <laughs> and they're great mates. But the other the other thing in all of this was Shurful Islam, the Bangladeshi Seema, when he got a wicket in the first game. Uh, they immediately started celebrating by all pointing at their wrists to take the piss out of the Angelo Matthews timed out dismissal. Um, so this is just, this is boiling up. Uh, They're at the start of a series. I'm not sure what television stations are covering these games, but you can just imagine there's going to be an international incident um, at some point, more than there has been in the past mm. over the next fortnight, and I am and I cannot wait. So, we'll, yeah, hold us to account on that. Let's get Fidel and Isam to rejoin us on the final word to go into real depth on the um, on the, the stoush ongoing. Yeah. Not, not, not enough um, grudges involve wristwatches these <laughs> days. You know? I mean, imagine it used to be quite a common thing of people pinching each other's watches and whatnot. You're always trying to find out who stole your watch. But, yeah, um, it's interesting that... 
Yeah, you know, like like the way like the way that on your phone, on your smartphone, the symbol for a telephone is still like a nineteen eighties telephone, which most people, anyone you know, ten years younger than us, would never have used. That would never pick yeah. one up, but they still know what the symbol means. It's true. Why is the save icon still a floppy disk? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good why point. do people, you know, why do people still do the poke out two fingers? But we do that with Winnie. Face Winnie, to, Winnie's to aware telephone. of it, just playing, you yeah. know, playing around. She knows that is telephone. Yeah, if you have a fist with your thumb and your finger pointing out and talk on the phone, that but that's not what a smartphone looks like. It should be like a flat palm that you just place. That should be being on the phone with mm. a, a flat, a flat palm, a face palm. It feels like you're sort of yeah, yeah, in about dismay. to go to sleep. Yeah, yeah. It's a one-handed Stuart Broad. It's a mm. one-handed Edward Munch. Uh, shall we keep moving? Yeah, the conversation? Should, should we go over to? Um, should we go back to the UAE? Uh, well, we're yeah. all, we're vaguely in that part of the world for the Afghanistan Love. Island series. They Love played going back there. The test last week, mm. and uh, they've been picking it up playing one day as Jeff. Yeah, I love countries where um, uh, all of the letters are a vowel. That's good stuff. Um, yeah, three ODIs and then three T20s after Ireland won the test match. Uh, the second one, though, was a wash out. The first one at Sharjah, Afghanistan won pretty narrowly. 35 runs. Ramanullah Gurbaz, mm. uh, one whose work we've enjoyed. Sixth career ton for him in the 50-over format. 121 at just over a runner ball. Uh, Ibrahim Zadran made 60 with him up the top. Those two, that opening partnership, that chemistry. Ireland made 275 for eight, chasing Harry Tector, 138, Lorcan Tucker, 85. That next gen really, really flourishing now for Ireland. Um, and they saved it from 34 for three. Mm. That's what Australia were in the test match, and then they were 34 oh, yeah. for four. Um, and they, they got it to 207 for four when, uh, when, when, when Tucker was out, and then Tector was the eighth to go. After he made his ton, his fifth one-day ton, averaging 51 in the format. I think he's ranked like five in the world now, Tector. Mm. So I know he hasn't... Um, there have been high-profile moments when he hasn't delivered when playing for Ireland. Yep. But, you know, he, he, along with Tucker, it feels like that... And this is a great thing, by the way, because neither of them are involved in the golden generation. They have mm. no links to when Ireland were an associate nation and marching up to get full member status. And they have no relationship to the side that played in the 2007-11... Yep. 7-11-15 World Cups. This is the group who will yep. take them to the next World Cup, and will be, they'll be twenty-seven and twenty-nine, I think, respectively. Had Lorcan on the show last year; he's a really switched-on guy. In fact, we're playing um, a game at his club on the ADB tour, um, which will be lovely in a yep. few weeks' time. So, um, yeah, really pleased to see it's those two. It's not like they're not relying on the older firm. It's it's the group who um, who are coming through and the bat on has been us. passed. Yeah, sadly though, um, I was really looking forward to going to Ireland this summer. Um, to watch Australia play there. It's in the FTP. They're going to be playing one day internationals yeah. and T20s. And all the information that was being relayed to me was that this was happening. Um, unfortunately, that August series that was going to be tacked on before the England white yep. ball stuff that we mentioned before, um, which is a clever way of doing it. Like we've long advocated for Australia lose, using yep. existing trips to England to give a little bit back to Ireland. But this doesn't really feel like an Australia thing. Um, unfortunately, and this is tri Tristan Lavalette's yarn on Crick Info, I should note, he's the one that broke it. They just don't have the resources to, to kit out all these venues. So the costs for putting on cricket has yeah. gone up exponentially since COVID. They don't own any of their stadia like they right. have to use they don't have club grounds they, they don't have, have it yeah so malahide they have to build temporary stands and all that so last year they couldn't really afford to play at malahide in those three games against bangladesh which were crucial so they seeded home ground advantage played them at chelmsford and ultimately lost those mm. matches which would have got them auto automatic qualification for the world cup had things broken their way so this is where ireland's competitiveness has been compromised yep. you know how much better would they be if they were playing australia in a three or four or five game series which now is not possible so you know these ic meetings that are happening this week in Dubai I hope yeah. they look at this as an example of everything we've been banging on about for ages rights pooling how do you make sure that this kind of series is prioritised where Ireland aren't left in a situation where this would cripple them for years as it was put to me if they yeah. put it on um, and they've got a full FTP this year by the way Ireland are playing a shitload of cricket this year and that's great but mm. it's so sad that this, this particular series has to hit the fence because the exposure it would, would have achieved and the extra um, extra development that surely would have provided them. Australia have never been there for a bilateral series. They've only ever played one game there. I think you yep. went in 2015. Yeah, so this is an yeah. example of where the status quo doesn't work in Belf, um, Belf, and, Belf. And, and where the finances of the game are simply not reasonable. And the mm. extra layer, Jeff, with the, the money that's being withheld at the moment. I, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I think there are questions for Cricket Island in this as well because they have had their first payout of the new elevated amount. 
some of that was withheld because there was an amount that was, as far as I remember it, so um, don't, don't kick me if I get this completely wrong, there was an amount extended to them by the ICC, which they were then being charged interest on, which they shouldn't have been. That's right, yeah. Um, there was the loan, wasn't there? Yeah, so there was a loan yeah. which had an interest component um, and the ICC, rather than cooperating with Cricket Island to, to figure out the best way to manage this loan into the future, have just unilaterally withheld um, a substantial amount from the yep. payout. So Cricket Island still got paid out more than they would have previously, but they got about half as much as they would have got in that distribution. And if they had have got the full distribution, they would have been uh, more able to put the series on. But there's also the question of whether, um, like what was happening with broadcast rights for this and were they, because if they'd been able to actually sell the broadcast rights for it, you would have thought that would be enough to recoup the cost of putting on the series. So, well, that's the other part. There, of this. There's the question of have have they have they failed in actually um, managing the sale? <coughs> Excuse me. Have they failed in managing the sale successfully? Um, which which is also a factor. I'd uh, I'd like to at least resolve that before pointing at the ICC and saying it's all the ICC. Yeah, no, that, that's fair. And there, and there has been um, additional reporting on this saying that they've not they didn't sell the TV rights into right. the Australian market, which. Is increasingly a thing as well, right? You know, yeah. You're seeing. Um, if, if you're a broadcaster here, you might say, "Well, we're not. You know, what, what, why are we going to pay a bunch of extra money for that?" Series, right. Which I mean, won't it'll rate very well. It'll, that's right. Middle of the night. Yeah. Um, games that. Um, yeah, I, I understand that's complex, but as we keep coming back to, and the Martin Sten report to the ICC the other week that Brad and I discussed in some detail, it's not just about like one series. It's about how do you. Um, pull the rights in a way that means the distributions yep. are more equitable across the board because at the end of the day, it's still a one-day international, it's still a T20 international yeah. um, and valuing one as being more important than the yeah. other um, in such a crude way does well, lend itself to situations like this, which also, is also unfortunate. The, the efficiency um, <laughs> situation of um, uh, if you're like of making every board have to keep um, managing these sales individually for every series yeah. to every home nation all of the time. Like some, there, there is so much extra work going into this because, because everybody's having to do all of it all the time rather than having it done in one job lot um, in, in, in one sort of more compact transaction. Yeah. So there's, as I say, there's a meeting taking place in Dubai this week and I like to believe something like this would be an example that not just Ireland and Australia, but other boards can point to and go, you know, this could be us next, right? Yeah. If you're in the FTP, it doesn't actually mean anything anymore if mm. this can happen. Mm. Anyway, um, last topic on our agenda today before we wrap up the show very, very quickly is the Sheffield Shield final round. Now, a reminder that Tasmania, last round, Tasmania on top on 46, they will be in the final. It's who they're going to play. WA on 40, Victoria mm -hmm. on 37, and I think New South Wales could theoretically leapfrog both of those uh, if they got a great run this week in South Australia and Queensland, yep. uh, rounding it out in fifth and sixth. Um, South Australia playing Tasmania, which becomes a dead rubber of sorts. SA made 271, and Tassie in reply, uh, a 27 for three. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of the game here because it's not... We'll do it next week. We'll do it next week. Um, WA, Victoria, that's the blockbuster. So WA have made 244 on day one, and Victoria, having sent in WA, a seven for one in reply. So that's just worth noting that for WA, top seven. scoring, seven seven runs seven for one runs wicket. For yes. one okay. So nobody in the WA side made it out of the 40s. There right. were a couple of starts. Goodwin, he made 100 last week. Aaron Hardy is an absolute gun, made 40 as well, playing for Surrey this year. Murray Goodwin's back. Cartwright, 31. Inglis, 20. But the Victorian bowler <laughs> stepped up. Boland, who came back from yep. New Zealand to play in this game, four for 41, leading the attack. Fergus O'Neill, he's had a great season, mm. three for 48. Yep. Todd Murphy, hot toddy, two Amazing for 54. Amazing player for a dog, Fergus O'Neill. And, uh, and Sutherland played his role as well as first change, along with Perry, who picked up a wicket. So, And in reply, the wicket they have lost so far, even though this will be out of date soon, uh, was Nick Maddinson, which mm. feels huge, given Maddo came back and made two hundreds after returning. So Marcus Harris and Mitchell Perry, the night watchman, are in overnight. So all eyes on that game at the Junction Oval. And the other game barely got a start, I think. I think New South Wales... Uh, who are playing Queensland? That I'm would be the other team. Sure, yeah. have I got that yeah. right in my yeah, head? That's, yes, that, that's the one team that hasn't been mentioned yet. They barely played. It's fourteen for two Queensland. Okay. They they were mostly rained off there at Allen Borderfield. So right. a lot more Shield stuff next week. A lot more from us next week. Uh, the next uh, weekly show that you will get from Jeff and me will be when I am in London. I think that's how we've worked it out. So mm -hmm. we'll be back on unusual time zones, but that's okay. We're used to this. Um, a parting thank you again to cbysuper.com.au. Bloody love you for what you've done for us. Thank you to all of our patrons who've been mm -hmm. there from the start as well. We adore you just as much, if not more. 
If not more, why am I comparing oh, well. them? We love them all in different ways. Yeah. Um, and for everybody for listening to the programs we made across the summer, the daily shows on the tours and, and all the other bits and pieces, it's been, it's been terrific. If you want to get involved with the Final Word commercially, now is not a bad time to do it. Send me an email, finalwordcricket at gmail.com and I can, and I can um, have a lengthy conversation with you and tell you the story of the Final Word from, um, and you know, show you under the hood and see whether you want to get involved for, say, the next six months or something like that. There you go. So now I'm going to take go. my Canards tape measure and just go and measure some shit up. Makes the job easy. See, yeah, see, see, see what is... Hit us up, Canards. What, what, what is what height, <laughs> what depth and what width. Uh, right, uh, yeah, that's it. That's enough. We'll, we'll see you next, next, next week, next time, whenever. Bye. Bye.